raging and waves are crashing round when my heart is heavy and i'm swiftly going down help me to remember however rough the sea that underneath the current your arms are holding me Well, thank you for that special. Holly, touch Holly. She got choked up, couldn't finish the. We, uh, we had a fellow in our church in Michigan when we served there. Um, he was a part of the color guard, the honor guard, and he got to go to um, Detroit Pistons games. And this was shortly after 9-11, and America was at the you know, height, pinnacle of patriotism at the time. and. Uh, Last name is Hudson. I can't think of his first name. But um, whoever was going to sing the national anthem didn't show up at the game. And uh, Brother Hudson, he could sing in specials, but he didn't have like a solo quality voice, you know. He didn't know that. But he didn't have a solo quality voice. And so he said, I'll sing the national anthem. And would you? And he's in, he's in uniform. And so he um, goes to sing the national anthem. And he gets halfway through. You know what happens when you sing in front of people. Yeah, man. He forgot the words to the national anthem. And so he started stumbling, but everybody mistook it for, here's, here's a guy in uniform. He loves his country. He serves his country. He's getting choked up in the middle of it. Uh, the crowd helped him finish the national anthem. And at the end, he got a roaring standing ovation by 40,000 people. At the, the Detroit Pistons game. So, anyway, no, we appreciate all, all that serving special music, and that's a lot of work. We appreciate it. Mm-hmm. All right, we're in the Gospel of Mark this morning, Mark chapter number 11. We finished up uh, the book of Jonah. We had a little uh, diversion from our series in the Gospel of Mark, and in Mark chapter number 11, we're going to enter back in. 
and uh, we're going to enter into Christ's Passion Week. Uh, from chapter number 11 through the end of the chapter, we're going to see what transpires in uh, the last week of Christ's ministry here on the earth, His resurrection, His commission to His disciples, uh, and we're going to be right here with the Lord. Uh, and, and we'll uh, do Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11 this morning. So when you, when you find your place there in the Gospel of Mark, we'll stand together for the reading of God's Word, and we'll read from verse number 1 down through verse number 11. It says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples. And he saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him, and bring him to me. Or bring him. And it says, And if any man say unto you, Why do, do ye this? Say ye, that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where the two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and straightway them in the way. And they went before, and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked round about upon all these things, and now the even tide was come, he went out of Bethany with the twelve. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray with me as I lead us, and let's ask God uh, for a blessing from his word this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for just the opportunity to be here gathered together on the first day of the week and to celebrate your victory over death, hell, and the grave. We thank you that we get to celebrate your resurrection here this morning. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would just bless us and watch over us. I pray that uh, the word of the Lord would have free course in our midst. I pray that you would help us uh, to understand your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see Christ's reflection here in Scripture. Lord, I pray that you would help us to um, see our own souls in light of Scripture this morning. I pray that you would meet the need of the hour. Lord, I pray that you would uh, help us to see the Lord high and holy and lifted up this morning. Amen. Help us to truly be able to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, and Lord, we ask for a special blessing. Uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, so this is a very common story, a story that we're familiar with, a story that we've heard from Sunday school. And I don't need a show of hands this morning, uh, but pretty much all of us have been into church for any length of time. We have heard uh, a, this account preached and we have heard this account taught about the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And what we're going to do this morning, just very simply, is we're going to take a lesson from this colt, from this donkey, and we're going to compare it to our own life uh, and our own service unto the Lord. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the Lord of the colt, the colt here this morning, the Lord of the colt, and who the Lord was. We're going to look at uh, how uh, this particular event, uh, how the disciples saw it, and then also we're going to look at it, how uh, the general crowd saw what Jesus' behavior and what Jesus did on Palm Sunday, how they would have interpreted it and how they responded accordingly. Uh, and then last of all, we'll look at uh, this cult, we'll look at this letting, loosing and letting of the cult. Uh, and the title of our sermon is this morning, Loose Him, uh, for the Lord hath need of Him. Loose Him. For the Lord hath need of him. And the Lord has still given his disciples this command to go, loose the colt, 
for the Lord hath need of him. And then I'm going to close with an illustration from Alaska. So, turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 49. Genesis chapter number 49. The day that uh, the disciples were given this commission, he says that there's going to be an intersection between two streets. He says, if you go there, you're going to find, it says in Matthew, you're going to find the mother of the colt, and then you're going to find a young colt. You're going to find a young colt upon which no man has ever ridden. Uh, and we are, not, we, you know, in our uh, re republic, in our uh, constitutional republic, or in our democracy, we're not used to kingship and lordship and a sovereign ruler. Uh, but in this day and age, this is the language which they speak. This is the environment in which they, uh, they thrived, in which they grew up. And they knew that no one rides the king's beast. It is alone set apart uh, for the king, and no one touches the king's beast. No one rides the king's beast. Uh, and this cult is going to be for the king. Uh, he says, when they ask you, why, why are you taking our cult? Imagine this, someone comes and says, uh, give me your car keys, take your car. Why? The Lord. God, he has need. I'm going to take your bicycle. I'm going to take your whatever. Uh, the Lord hath need of him. Uh, and there must have been some sort of a spiritual understanding uh, by the owner of this cult. Well, if the Lord, the king needs, he can commandeer uh, any vessel that he has need of for his kingdom. Uh, and this man loses the cult uh, and he lets the king have his cult. Uh, and the interesting thing about this donkey is that he had never been ridden. He'd never been broken. That's another thing we don't understand in the suburbs about uh, you can't just take a, a colt of a, uh, of a horse or a donkey. Donkeys are very stubborn. I'm not going to ask you how many have been called a donkey before, but um, they're notoriously stubborn, and they buck, and they bray, and they bite, uh, and they're wild animals until their will is broken. Uh, and so this is a significant account here. And so what the disciples see... Uh, as the Lord gives them this commission. And, uh, you know, when you are in service to the Lord, uh, we made this proclamation here before I left, is uh, with, through, through Jonah, is that the only sign and the only miracle you're going to get pre-salvation has already been given. That is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, uh, and if you do not believe that, you're not going to see further miracles. That, that God came, came to earth, Emmanuel, God with us, that Jesus lived. He lived according to Scripture. He died the perfect God-man. He died for sins. He was buried. Uh, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. And He rose forevermore. He Amen. is the life and the Amen. resurrection. Uh, and He comes to give life. He comes to give life more abundantly. Sure. And once He resurrects your life through the power of his resurrection, the power that he has over death, hell, and the grave to give you new life and life more abundantly, uh, you get to see different miracles as you are a disciple and as you follow him that you will be guided by the hand of the Lord. Uh, and so as these disciples obey this commission to go secure this donkey, to secure this beast for the Lord, he sends them two by two. This is a picture of his church. It's a picture of the authority of the church coming to the authority of the king. It's a picture of soul winning. This is exactly what we do when we carry the gospel and preach the gospel to every creature, loose him. Why? Because the Lord hath need of him. And that's exactly the why we win people to Christ. Notice at Pentecost, uh, 3,000 people weren't saved, baptized, and they just went on their way. And the church met, met the next Sunday and 120 met. No, 3,000 people saved, they were baptized, and they continued. They were added to the church, they joined the church, and it says, and they continued uh, in the disciples' doctrine, the breaking of bread, and the fellowship, and of prayers, that the church grew by 3,000 people. This was an empty profession. This was the Lord claiming people for His service and for His kingdom. And as your disciple and as you serve the Lord, you get to see the Lord do miraculous things. Amen. Another thing about this donkey, this was a picture of what Jesus did when he calls people to himself. Uh, hey, Abraham, hey, old man, you know, in his 70s, uh, come follow me and I'll show you a land that I'm going to give to your people. And by thee, all the peoples of the earth shall be blessed. And Abraham set out not knowing whether he went. Uh, it's the same thing with Jesus calling his disciples. John chapter number one, it's Andrew and Peter. And then, uh, then there's a man by the name of Nathaniel. I love how the, uh, John chapter number one ends. Uh, and so Nathaniel, he's a little speculative. 
Uh, and he says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And here's our answer, come and see. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I have found him to be good. If you come to him, you will find him to be good as well. Uh, so here comes Nathanael, and he sees Jesus, and Jesus says, Nathanael, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He's like, I've never met you before. How do you know me? And Jesus says something intimate that you don't know, and I don't even know what it means. I saw you when you were underneath a fig tree. Now, you can write all sorts of lengthy commentary on what that means. You don't know what it means. You know who knew what that means? Nathaniel and Jesus. Yeah. That's right. I, you know, I'd like to speculate. Uh, maybe Nathaniel was hidden as a baby underneath the fig tree when Herod was killing babies and they're saving him from abortion. And then maybe it was this. Maybe he had a prayer meeting and he said to God in the privacy of his own heart, if you reveal yourself to me, I will give my life to you. And God calls him into account. I saw you when you were underneath the fig tree. So God knew about this donkey. And here the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ was on display. Um, and so he, he, he knows us. He knows our down sittings. He knows our uprisings. He knows the numbers of hair on my head. Amen. I made his work easy, right? <laughs> And uh, you got a thick head of hair this morning. He knows how many hairs are on your head. It matters to him about you. He knows you. He knows where you are at. And so the disciples went uh, in, in the divine foreknowledge and the omniscience of Almighty God. And they had a divine appointment, just like, uh, just like we see in the book of Acts. You know, Philippi, uh, uh, the uh, deacon there. Uh, what's, what's the Phil Philip, yeah, I think it's like Philippine. No, that's not right. Philip, the deacon, go out in the wilderness, preaching revival. And he has a divine appointment with uh, the Ethiopian eunuch there. And, and the Lord is in the business of get leading and guiding his disciples. So that's what the disciples saw uh, when they went and obeyed the Lord and his command and went and got this donkey for the Lord and brought him to the Lord. The Lord has need of him. They got to experience the power of the Lord. And as you and I submit unto the power of Jesus and as he commissions us, we go in the spirit and we go in the power of the Lord. He who has commissioned us has bestowed upon us his power to do his will and to do his work. Now, what did the people see this day? The people are undoubtedly, we're gonna, we're gonna show you from the Old Testament, uh, the people undoubtedly knew that Jesus was proclaiming himself to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Messiah who is sent. Remember, this is a highly religious people. This is the week of Passover. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about big religion. Okay, we talk about big pharma, you know, big corporations, big government. Uh, tonight, we'll look at uh, big religion and Christ's rebuke of big religion. Uh, well, this is big religion. Jerusalem is, is um, swollen in size, probably at least one million pilgrims there. Perhaps 200,000 to 250,000 lambs would be bought and sold. Big religion, big money, man. See that tonight. Uh, and uh, and, and 200,000 plus lambs will be sold as the Lamb of oh, God yeah. is going to shed His blood yep. uh, for the sins of the whole world. And uh, busy time here. And in in this coronation ceremony, the people are going to understand they're a religious people. They know their Bible, which was the Old Testament of this time, and they know exactly who Christ is proclaiming himself to be. Um, let me challenge you. Is that as New Testament believers, we ought to know the Old Testament. So remember, your Bible is broken up into two sections. Old Testament, New Testament. Old Covenant, New Covenant. And uh, how many of you have ever been to a play before? Usually the plays are broken up into a couple of acts with an intermission in the, in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, your Bible is very, very similar. So if you showed up just for the second act and you didn't know the first act, uh, you, you wouldn't know exactly what's going on. It's the same thing, too, if you're only familiar with the New Testament and not with the Old Testament, you're coming in on the second act without understanding what the first act is about. Well, there's going to be a proclamation from God, from the fall of mankind, that there was going to be a Messiah to come. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree in the garden, 
and the curse of sin was proclaimed upon all of mankind. You know that you were there, Ernie, and I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, in Adam, all have sinned. Yeah, that's right. Our representative for the human race sinned in the Garden of Eden. Right there, when Adam sinned, there was a proclamation from God that he was going to send a redeemer, the seed of a woman. Genesis chapter number 3 was going to bruise the serpent's head. And so when God made a covenant, he made a promise with Abraham. He said, by thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Abraham knew exactly what God was talking about, is that through his progenity, through his lineage, that salvation was going to come, that there would be a Messiah, that there would be a Savior, that God, Emmanuel, God with us, Isaiah chapter number 7, mm -hmm. that God was going to come in flesh and He was going to save mankind. Genesis chapter number 49, I want you to notice here, the blessings proclaimed by Jacob, or the Bible calls him Israel at this point in his life, upon the tribe of Judah. So again, we're in Jerusalem in Mark chapter number 11. And the people there in Jerusalem at this time would have been very familiar with the prophecy, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And they would have been very familiar with the promise, the Messiah that was supposed to come through this kingly line. And in Genesis 49, if you look at verse number 8, So Jacob's about to die, and he's blessing the 12 tribes of Israel. He has a special blessing here for Judah, I want you to notice. And he says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah's going to be a conqueror. He's going to conquer Israel's enemies. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Here's a lion that's going to come forth out of the tribe of Judah. Verse number 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Amen. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Moses was the great lawgiver of Israel. And Moses said there was going to be one that's going to come that's going to be like as unto me, that he is going to be a great lawgiver. Remember that there's a threefold uh, office of Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. That here is a sovereign lawgiver that's going to come from Israel. And it says, notice, I want you to notice there again. It says, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Shiloh there, notice in your Bible, is capitalized. Shiloh is a person. This means the sent one or the Messiah that is going to come. And unto him shall be the gathering of the people. I want you to notice verse number 11. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. What are we going to see Jesus coming into Jerusalem on? An ass's colt. A donkey's offspring. Here's a prophecy from Genesis chapter number 49 that is fulfilled when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. And it says, he has washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Uh, what's Jesus going to do this very same week? He's going to institute the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is the blood of my New Testament, the new covenant. So, all right, your Bible's broken up into two. Ready? Let's pretend we're in Sunday school for a second, okay? Old Testament, Old Covenant. Here the sovereign comes down and makes a covenant with people. Here is the law. Here's what the people say. Ready? At Mount Sinai, the law is given. All that the Lord has said, we will do. We will obey this covenant from our sovereign God. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Did they obey all ten commandments? No, so, when you're doing jail ministry, I always say, is there a penalty for breaking the law? And they look at me and laugh. You know, they're all wearing orange. <laughs> I said, there's penalty for breaking God's law as well. I says, you know, 
Here's another thing, too, we get on the highway. You know there's 100,000 plus laws in the state of New York that'll put you behind bars. Yeah, man, that's messed up. I said, but God's given you 10 laws that will keep you out of jail. All you got to do is remember these 10 things and obey them. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> Not so. So here's the holiness of God revealed in his covenant to Israel, and they continually break it. But God has given them the ceremonial law, this ceremonial system, all of its types, shadows, and figures of him who should come. Not only is there a sacrifice in the temple, but my house shall be a house of prayer unto all people. The temple was given to the man of peace, Solomon, and it was a picture of God's peace with mankind. There's only peace through sacrifice for the broken covenant. Now here's what God's promise was to Abraham. Now they made this covenant promise with Abraham and his people, and here's what you would typically do. Your sovereign, your ruler, your emperor, as he come in and he made peace with your people, your community, here is the rules of the agreement. Now we're going to make a sacrifice, and you, the lesser, are going to walk through the pieces of this sacrifice, the pieces of the sacrificial system. And what you're saying is that if I break this law, I will be like this sacrifice. I will be cut into pieces. Mm -hmm. But if you remember God's covenant with Abraham, who walked through the pieces? God did. That he was going to be your substitute for breaking his law. And Jesus said, this is the blood of my covenant. That he has fulfilled his Old Testament covenant and given unto you a new covenant by his spirit. And so here, Jacob, he says, to, Jacob says to Judah, he says, from your line is going to come sovereigns, David. Jesus is going to rule and reign from the throne of David. We see in Matthew, we see in Luke, that uh, the gospel writers were clear to put in there Christ's genealogy showing that he is the rightful king of Israel, that he is the forecasted seed of David. He is the sovereign ruler here in Jerusalem. The people understood this. Now took, uh, look, if you will, to Zechariah chapter number 9. Pastor Major, interesting enough, made mention of this in the opening of Zechariah. Didn't you? I thought maybe I was hearing it. Sometimes when you study a sermon, you see it everywhere you go, you know. So, Zechariah chapter number 9. Now, when I was preaching in Alaska, they all use pew Bibles. So uh, you could say, whoever gets there first, holler out the page number. <laughs> Toward, <laughs> towards the end of your New Testament... Almost to the Old Testament, towards the New Testament, is Zechariah. Chapter number 9. This is 500 years before Christ rides into Jerusalem. Uh, here's another forecast in the Old Testament about Christ coming, proclaiming himself to be king. Zechariah 9.9. 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king, capital K, king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Uh, so here, your king, capital K, is coming. Here is the Messiah king promised under the line of David. He is come. You are going to know who he is because he is not going to come in uh, like Napoleon. He's not going to come in like Caesar riding on some uh, great steed, some horse, some symbol of dominance. He will someday in the future, by the way. Yes, sir. Um, but he is going to come meek and lowly, He's going to come having salvation. He is going to be the saving servant, the savior of mankind. Now, here's another thing to notice when you're reading the Old Testament. You'll see the suffering savior alongside of the ruling sovereign. Look at verse number 10. It says, And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, from river, from the river 
even to the ends of the earth. So it's not uh, from the river to the sea, you know. Here's from the river to the sea. Uh, Jerusalem shall be free. It, the Lord is going to rule here. Look at verse number 11. Amen, amen. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water. Notice another thing that this uh, ruling sovereign does is he proclaims liberty to the captives. Uh, he releases those that are bound. Uh, he looses wild, bucking, braying colts, donkeys, and he looses them and he frees them to be ruled over. Let's turn to Revelation chapter number 5. Revelation chapter number 5. Last book in your Bible. So as Christ comes down from the Mount of Olives, and he's going to make this same trek again, you're going to see at his second coming uh, there in Jerusalem, one of the things that we remember in the Bible, it's important for us to understand there's an old covenant, there's a new covenant. Also, there's a first coming and that there is a second coming of Christ. And many times these are portrayed in the Bible side by side, directly side by side. There's a first advent and that there is a second advent. The first time the Lord comes, He is riding upon a donkey. He is a saving, suffering servant. As the people come out and they see... The Lord coming, they take off their coats. And you'll see this other places in the Bible. This was customary this day and age. Uh, there's a reference in my notes. Uh, as Jehu, Jehu was anointed king, uh, that the people took off their garments and they placed them before Jehu. What's that old movie that uh, Humphrey Bogart takes off his coat and lays it over the puddle so that the gal doesn't have to step in the puddle and muddy her feet? This is different. When I take off my coat, at the coronation of the king. Mm -hmm. Remember Saul, when he was holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen? He yeah. was the authority. And they're saying, okay, since you have authority to, to stone Stephen to death, here's my coat. I'm putting myself underneath your authority. And he holds their coats. Well, here's what they're doing when Christ is coming, is that they are, by their own outward profession, yielding themselves to the king and publicly declaring him to be their king. And then they're saying to him, Hosanna, which means to save now, to save now. Um, in Revelation chapter number five, here we see the first and the second coming and we see the purpose for the first and second coming. Revelation chapter number five. It says there, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne, written within, and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Um, so if a book by a sovereign was written and sealed, only those with authority could open up the seal. Most Bibles, like mine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven seals. And so people know their Bible and their, their publishers. A lot of times they'll put those, they'll put seven ribs. On your, if your Bible doesn't have that, throw it. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but that's where they get it from. And so there's going to be a seven sealed book, okay? And it says, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Um, how many would say the inside of your Bible, you would agree with this statement that the Bible makes about itself? Exceeding great and precious promises. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now who is able to unlock, unseal those great and precious promises? Amen. So notice, notice this. Who's able? Verse number two. Verse three. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open up the book, neither to look thereon. No one is good enough 
to open up the promises in the book. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Genesis chapter number 49. Lion of the tribe of Judah. He says, he's able to open up the book and to loose the seals thereof. So there's a lion. Verse number 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a, uh, what's the next word? Lamb. Look, notice capital L. A lamb. Is John the Baptist the forerunner of Christ? Uh, he is he's coming. He's the, the friend of the bridegroom. He's introducing uh, the bride to the groom. Uh, and what was his introduction to Christ? Behold, the Lamb of God, Amen. which taketh away the sin of the world. And it says, so he turned and looked, and behold, a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And it came, and he took of the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So remember, Christ says to his disciples, this is the blood of the covenant. This is the blood of the covenant, which is shed for thee. Remember, when we get to heaven, only one person is going to have wounds. Evelyn's looking forward to not having to use a walker anymore. She says she's going to skydive off the New Jerusalem cube. Yeah, yeah she's going to. And uh, she's going to go skipping down the, the streets of gold. That uh, we'd be given a new glorious body like as unto Jesus Christ. There's only one lamb as it had been slain. Thomas, behold my hands. Thomas, behold my side. Behold my feet. And so when you get to heaven and you behold the Son of God in the flesh, who is clothed in flesh, given the resurrected body, you will behold a lamb as it had been slain from before the foundations of the earth. And only that lamb, that conquering lion and lamb, is worthy for, to open up all those promises of salvation and all the hope of eternal life and the hope of heaven. Only he's going to be worthy to open up the word of God in heaven. And so he takes the book out of the right hand and it says, verse number eight, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and had made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on earth, and under the sea, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them heard, I sang, Blessed and honor and glory and power be unto them that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And the neat thing here about Revelation chapter number five is that I'm going to be there. That's right, brother. Amen. Me too. <coughs> That's going to be a great praise and worship service that we are going to see the king face to face. 
we will glorify him face to face. Thou hast redeemed us. And notice here is a promise. All peoples, nations, languages, and tongues is that the gospel is going to bring in a great harvest of souls. Yes, sir. Amen. So the people knew that Jesus was declaring himself king. It wasn't the first time that people professed Jesus to be king and then immediately turned away from him. Only a few days later, a lot of people in the crowd, I don't think all of them, but a lot of people in the crowd are going to be, oh, no, crucify him, crucify him. You know, somebody quoting scripture verses or um, talking about Jesus a lot does not mean that they are yielded to him. What the people really wanted at this point in time is, you know, you look, in, you look at um, John chapter number 6, and the people come to him. Jesus walked on the water to escape the people. Minister for a while, you want to walk across water, escape from people too. Uh, and then they follow him around the lake and they say, we want to make you king. And he says in John chapter number six, he says, you don't want to make me king because you saw the miracles. You want to make me king because you ate of my bread and were full. All they cared about, their God was their belly. They wanted Jesus for what he could do for them. And so most of the people here wanted him to be king so they could uh, kick these Romans out of their country and build a wall. You know, lower taxes, <laughs> decrease the, in, the inflation, and, uh, you know, make Israel great again, right? <laughs> Let me tell you something, is that Jesus is king and you're not. Amen. You know that uh, you, you ask anything according to his will, he hears it. Yes, sir. You ask anything against this, well, he don't hear it. Health and wealth, prosperity, gospel is a lie. That's Let me right. tell you something. You Amen. give your life to Christ, you are, you are going to enjoy life. But I want to tell you something. Christ's kingdom is not of this world. Pilate's going to come to Jesus, John chapter number 21. He says, art thou a king? He said, do you say this of yourself or does someone else tell you about that? He says, he says, you're the one on trial. You're not me. No, sorry, Pilate. You're on trial. So what you do with Jesus uh, is going, to, and here's what Jesus does this day. He shows his hand that he is the sovereign king. Amen. And the people have a choice that day to make. When Christ shows his hand for who he really is and reveals yourself to him, you have a decision to make. Either that you're going to really, with your heart of hearts, put down your coat and let him be Lord of your life, or you're going to say, away with him. This man is not worthy. And so what does Jesus say to Pilate? He says, my kingdom is not of this world or else my servants would fight. He came as a saving servant and you and I come and do his work in his ministry here upon this earth. You know, it says in, in Romans chapter number 10, uh, it says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We were talking in Sunday school from John chapter number 13. And, um, and Jesus said, if you, if you wash the saints' feet, he says, uh, the master is, is uh, he says, the servants are not greater than their master. If I, Lord and master, have washed the saints' feet, so ye should wash one another's feet. And I, then before we read, uh, I think it was verse, seven, uh, verse 17, uh, John chapter 13. How many of you think you'd be happy washing people's feet? <laughs> you know what Jesus says in the next verse? If you do these things, happy are ye if ye do them. You know, there is happiness and joy. We say there's joy, 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 joy in serving Jesus, but it's a supernatural joy. It's not the joy of this world. It's not the joy of, of conquering and dominion. It's the joy of service. It's the joy of saving. So back in this day and age, in order for a coronation, in order for a Roman emperor or a, a, um, a, some sort of great general to be honored, you'd have to slain at least 5,000 enemies. Pentecost comes, 3,000 people conquered, saved, not destroyed, baptized, added to the church. Within one month's time, the Lord has saved over 5,000 people just in the city of Jerusalem. Why? Because that was his will, not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. All right, my illustration from Alaska. All right. 
So one of the wonderful things about missions trips, you go, you go away and you realize that the gospel is universal and truth is truth. And uh, that uh, people might not look like you, they might not talk like you, they might not uh, live the same kind of a life that they live, but there is a universal commonality in Christ that we come to the word of God and we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and you realize the closeness that you have in Christ that overcomes all of your other differences. Remember in heaven, all peoples, nations, languages, and tongues. Uh, so when we were in Alaska, um, my, my redneck friend, Travis Shaner, some of you have met him. He, I've known Travis for over 20 years. He flew in, he wanted to hunt a moose. Uh, I was right next to him when he shot his moose. And he cried like a baby. Got down on his knees. He was I took a video of it. I, I'll show it to you. He's, he's like, would you put that thing away? It's like, what are you feeling, Travis? What are you? <laughs> I, did, I took a video. And uh, I said, I'm going to tell your wife that you told me that that was the greatest day of your life. <laughs> but I mean, he was, and so, um, so there, there's all these, uh, you, you pick, uh, you pick, or we call them Eskimo, uh, up there. They really, they look, to me, they look Mongolian. I don't know if they'd be offended by that, but you can tell, man, they come right across that land bridge uh, a long time ago. And um, there's a fella in the church by the name of Jezreel, and Jezreel has, uh, he has built what uh, they call a mukai. Has anybody ever heard of a mukai? Look it up later, M-U-Q-I-I, -I, mukai. And a mukai is like a, a sauna, but it's a little bit different than a sauna. So he invites us to his mukai, and I was told a little bit about it. And uh, I said, uh, Travis, let's go to this mukai. He's like, I don't want to. He's like, Travis, you need to. You go to this mukai. Uh, so, we get, so we go to Jezreel's house, and what this, what this mukai is, is that you walk into this sauna, if you will, and it's a 10 by 10 room with benches, and then there's a little door, about this tall, and you open the door. Chris, we went to the house. The wife said, oh, they're in the Mukai. So we're like, okay, we got there. And um, we open up this little door about this tall. And inside, there's another 10 by 10 square. Down on the ground, lower level, is a wood stove. And when we got into this Mukai, it's 200 degrees. 200, 200, 200 degrees. Now let me tell you something. We've been living in 45 degree weather for about a week and a half now. And uh, so we get in the 200 degree and there's these Eskimos sitting there down in this muck eye. And so we, uh, we get down, we sit on towels. You can't sit like right on the bare wood there or you will, your skin will stick to that wood, man. It'll get cooked. So what they do is they do rounds of this and you take about five to eight minutes and, and uh, you get in there. Well, here's, here's, here's what they do is they take a cup of water that's on a stick and they pour it on the rocks that are on top of that furnace, and it goes from 200 to 225. Wow. They do this again. It goes from 225 to 250. While we were in there, they took it easy on us. They only went up to 275 degrees. <laughs> and the first round, we were probably in there like about four or five minutes, and you can bail any time you want to. Well, Timmy was the first one out, the first round. <laughs> And I was right behind Timmy, and Travis was right. And it's funny, every time they pour the water on the rocks, you hear this, tss, then you hear, oh, oh, oh. And Travis comes out and says, my hands are on fire. And last time, he said, well, sit on your hands. He puts, oh, and I, I had on top of my head, because they said, you've got to put something on top of your head because you don't have, you know, the heat's the highest point. You're going to get the top of your head burnt. And so I had like these washcloths, two washcloths on the top of my head, so I didn't burn the top of my head. And uh, so then you go out in the room, and it's 45 degrees outside. It takes you a good 15 minutes to get cooled back down in 45 degree temperature before you go back into the muck eye. Now, Travis made the mistake of saying to Timmy, he's like, Timmy, you were the first one out. Well, you challenge Timmy's manhood. He'd rather die than lose. <laughs> so we're, we're going to do five rounds of this. The second round, Timmy... Uh, stays in there. He's going to outlast everybody. He's like laying down the floor, turning from side to side. Um, any air moves on you, Rick, like if you breathe on yourself, it's like you're blowing fire on yourself. <laughs> and then again, they add in the cup and everyone's going, oh, 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 oh. You're trying to figure out how to breathe and not burn your lungs. I'm like trying to breathe around my tongue, to my nostrils, nose burning my nostrils. 
I'm, I'm out of here. And then we, you push and you go out in 45 degree weather. And um, Travis and I are sitting out there. And then we hear these Eskimos every time I go, Shh, oh, oh. And so you do something wild like that, you know, you're, it definitely, uh, it loosen, oh yeah, you loosen up. Travis was giddy. He was in his element uh, in there. And uh, we got to talking to Jezreel and Justin, these, these two Eskimo you pick uh, guys. And Jezreel, now he, he had a beautiful muck. I mean, this, you could tell he put a lot of TLC into this muck guy. I said, you got the like, nicest muck guy in the village? He said, second nicest. Uh, nice house. He starts, tell, oh, he starts telling us about how that he got saved two years ago. And he, he, said, uh, he said, you know, I... As an alcoholic, smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. Cigarette, packs of cigarettes up there are like 20 bucks a wow. pack, man. Wow. Good night. And, uh, and he said, you know, I had my family. And we're talking about Jezreel and this Justin. Two young men with beautiful young families, uh, you know, young children there. Jezreel, he said, he said, we used to come to the muck guy. And he says, Justin and I. He said that we would talk about all sorts of filthy trash. You know what they were? They were like that donkey, bucking and braying, in bonds and in slavery to sin. Justin was the first, I'm sorry, Jezreel was the first one saved. And he says that I led Justin to the Lord here in the Mokai. All he was doing is telling about how he gave his life, his heart to Jesus, and Jesus has changed his life. Uh, You know what the gospel did for him? Uh, People from the church uh, came to him, and in the authority of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, said essentially this, Loose him and let him go, for the Lord hath need of him. And since, you know, Jezreel got saved now, Justin got saved, and they had another, um, he said, tell them we all live in igloos. Uh, we had, had another you pick up there, uh, in there, not saved. You know, he has to listen to these two guys, tell, you know, give, praising the Lord and thanking the Lord for saving their souls mm-hmm. and redeeming them and how much better their family is. And both those guys got to hear Travis preach. We shared some of the preaching on the Sundays. We preached in three different the villages. And, and they got to hear Travis preach uh, a message. And his message was that the Lord saved my soul and his church saved my life. Amen. And uh, he says, you know, how many are 11 years old? He says, he says, raise your hand if you're 11 years old. Here's some 11-year-olds. He says, the first time I ever did, he names a drug. First time I ever did that was when I was 11 years old. He said, how many are 12 years old here? 12 years old. Name something else. 13 years old, he started using intravenous drugs. Oh, man. Travis could tell you how to make a meth lab. I mean, from scratch. That is a world in which he grew up in. He said, uh, he said at sixth grade, I stopped going, he stopped going to school at sixth grade. He said he knew that he would either be dead or in prison by the time he was an adult. What happened? His brother got saved. His brother came to him with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Travis was wonderfully, miraculously saved. Now, he needed those two disciples to bring him unto Christ. So he needed to be inside the local New Testament church. It's Jesus uh, will save your soul and his church will save your life. And he kept on saying, I should not be here. But what happened? The power of the gospel intervened. Let me challenge you this morning. Yield your life to the King of Kings. Yield with an understanding heart. That as you yield to the King of Kings, you say, Hosanna, save now. That you are asking God to do His will, not your will. The Lord Jesus came to do the will of the Father. And you and I are supposed to say, not my will, but thine be done. Let me challenge you, believer. Surrender to the Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior. Make it personal today. Let the Lord loose you. Let the Lord rule over you. 
Let the Lord be your God. Surrender your heart to the King of Kings. And uh, may today be the coronation ceremony between your soul and the Savior. Let's all stand. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for one worthy, one lamb of God, worthy to open up the books and the promises written in the book. And Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, this morning. Uh, that, uh, that you would help us to surrender our hearts, our Amen. lives, our Amen. wills to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just be with us. I pray that your spirit would move as uh, we have an invitation and uh, that we would uh, respond in accordance with your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As the pianist plays this morning, just ask you this. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I know for sure if I were to die, uh, that I would go to heaven. I've asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I could bring you to the place where I did business with God and uh, I asked Him to be my Savior. I'll slip my hand up as a testimony of the fact that I'm saved. I'm a child of God this morning. God bless you. That's you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not certain if I were to die today that I'd go to heaven. My prayer is that I would have peace and assurance and confidence that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Pastor, would you pray for me that I would be saved? If that's your hand, God bless you. Anybody else you say, that's my prayer this morning. God bless you. Anybody else? All right. Let's, uh, let's do business with the Lord. The altar's open. However, you'd like to speak to the Lord. Let's speak to Him. Thank you much for tuning in to the services of the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church. We wanted to tell you about our new app that you can go to the App Store right now and find the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church app. And there on our app, you'll find all of our services there. You'll find all of our music specials. Also, we have podcasts. We have blog posts there. And uh, you can look up our coming events. You can sign up for events there. And it's a beautiful new application. We're very excited to tell you about it. And please go right now and download that app. God bless you. And we'll see you next time.